We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and we are going to the home of the OG Formula One night race, and I could not be more excited. I love this race. For here we go. So excited. Yeah. I love that we have two street races back to back. I love that we have two races back to back. This is also so good. incredibly exciting. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. Especially considering we have a second summer break coming up after this weekend, and we are going to be without Formula One for a whole entire month. And I don't know how I like that. I mean, I wouldn't call it a second summer break. I would say we're just now on fall break. <laughs> but Fall <yes>. break? <laughs> It's kind of like last season when we, or no, yeah, last season when we didn't have China and it was just like spring break. <laughs> Here we are. Yes. But like that was not on purpose and this one is. So it's it's very interesting that they're like, yeah, we'll, we'll get like, we're, this is going to be the longest calendar in history, but also we're going to give two massive breaks with like three weeks of active racing in between. It just, it's very interesting to me how this was scheduled. Yeah, I mean, the only difference being summer break, it's like pencils down, no one's working, don't touch the car, can't do anything. We're still in season now, so like they can work on upgrades if they want to, work on the car, things like that. So that is a difference, but it's two long breaks back to back almost. Yeah, no, I, I like that you you have that distinction because because you're right. This is not a, a you know this is not a summer shutdown part two. This is just four weeks where we're gonna have to actually do those F one hundred ones we've been threatening type of deals. <laughs> I have a really busy life. I'm sorry. I know. I no and longer I just... live the Argentine lifestyle, unfortunately. So and I I just the end of camp was the end of camp, and if you know me, then you know what happened. Yes, no, camp is always a lot. I mean, also that. not that I'm the one going to camp, but I just hearing from you. You know plenty of Camp is busy. To... I was busy coming back, so we will get some F101s for you guys recorded for our fall break. Fall break. I like fall break. We're going to go with fall yeah, break. I, I can live with that. Yeah. Um, uh, but before well, we get into fall break. We have to get into the news of the week, and you would think there would be no news because we were just racing last weekend. But here we are with some fun things to talk about. I want to start off with my new favorite driver. I'm sorry, Carlos, but Franco has stepped into my heart. This little nugget. I love him so much. He's so cute. He's so itty bitty and he's a child. I'm obsessed with him. And so is everyone else because everyone is trying to get him a seat next year in Audi. So Williams is working, you know, to get him to be a full-time driver next year. It, the only r- true real seat open is Audi because we've talked about it. V-Carb has two people that will take that seat. They're not going to look at anybody else. Yeah. But his option would be Audi. I, so I don't love this, but I do love this because I want to see Franco Colapinto on the grid full-time next year. And I think, I guess I'll just take what I can get and it's going to be an Audi, but I don't know if this is like the best for him. The car we all know is probably going to be shit, but I mean, the Williams isn't great either. And look what he's doing in the Williams this year. So, yeah. So since I've had some time to marinate on it, because I am in the same boat that you are of like, is this really where we want our boy to go? But Here's the other I'm thing. Pause you. I love that we call him our boy now. And we have, like both mutual, like we both love him so much. I I'm glad that we like have someone we can both root for. <laughs> we 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 like he he showed up and we immediately adopted him. It's like that Brooklyn nine nine meme of like I've had this dog for, for two minutes, but you know, if anything happens to him, blah blah blah. It's yeah. it's kind of like that with, with with how he kind of has taken Formula One by storm. And I love it. But I, what I was saying is, you know, yes, it's not the best car on the grid. Far from it. Obviously, they have zero yeah. points this season. The The idea, I think, is so it's he's not going to a good car, but he's getting on the Formula One grid. And that sometimes is half the battle. Now, obviously, with Zhou Guan Yu, he got onto the Formula One grid and has been on the Formula One grid for a couple of years now. And he's not going anywhere and will probably be off the grid next year. But by and large, 
getting onto the grid is the hardest part. And yeah. then you can find another seat eventually. And we also don't know how Audi is going to be. Audi might be the second coming of Ferrari for all we know. When Ferrari was, you know, winning world championships, you know, every 20 minutes. So we we don't really know what Audi is going to look like. And so this could be, you know, next year will be mech at stake, but then Audi comes in and it's going to be, you know, puppies and, and unicorns and happiness and rainbows. No, I agree. And I think, I mean, just getting a seat, I think, is a big deal. So for him yeah. to only have two races under his belt and all of a sudden he's like the name on everyone's lips, right? And everyone wants to see him next year. He's doing great. I cannot like be on Instagram and not see someone talking about him and how he's so much better than Logan Sargent in two races or two years. Um, yeah. How he's already like actively like scoring points, getting into Q3. Um, I'm really excited for him. I'm so excited for him. Yeah, I, I, I fully agree. I, and I think that he could have a pretty, like, a solid Formula One career that he's already showing, having driven one of the hardest tracks on the calendar. And then this weekend will be really interesting to see how he does in another hardest track on the calendar. But I, know. I, I, you know, so, so it, so there's that. Obviously, the, front runners so far at stake have been Valtteri Botas and Gabriel Bortoletto from from F2 but I think if you're you know leaving Botas aside if you're comparing Bortoletto and Colapinto who have been driving in F2 together I would say that you have to give Colapinto the edge because Colapinto has actually driven in Formula One and scored points in Formula One and obviously Bortoletto doesn't have the same opportunities to do that but Cola Pinto's already scored points in Formula One in a right. not so great Williams car after, you know, no notice. 100%. I think that it's so hard when you try and pit like two F2 drivers against each other for a potential F1 seat because right. you don't know how they're going to do until they're actually in that car and actually racing. F2 is so different than F1, and every As F1 we've said. car is so different th from each other. So it's really. Honestly, the thing that makes or breaks a rookie, in my eyes, right, is just, like, their hunger to keep the seat. And I think Franco saw this as a, a huge opportunity that literally fell into his lap out of nowhere. And he's like, right. this is my only shot. I have seven, eight races to show that I deserve this. And that's it. Like, this is his only opportunity. Because he was not on anyone's list for a seat for next year. And now out yeah. of nowhere, he gets this opportunity. And I think he's just like seizing the moment. Yeah. And the other thing to, to remember is he also is bringing in like sponsors left, right, and center. Mercado Libre to, you know, is, is the one that, I that mean, stands we out. We start talking about like the economic <laughs> position of Argentina and the pesos they have to bring to the table. But I mean, I mean <laughs> yes, but you know, that's still, that's still but a factor. Yes. You know, one of the, oh. go, go. I will say about Argentina as a country and as a culture, they back their people 10,000%. Like, look at the Argentine national team in, in football, right? Everyone's obsessed. Everyone backs them. Same for the national rugby team. And everyone I know in Argentina is so excited. And, like, Mercado Libre jumped on that bandwagon as soon as he was in the seat. Like, not even 24 right. hours and they're a sponsor. So I will exactly. say that about like the culture in the country is they back their people 10,000% and everyone's so excited. People are trying to go to Brazil to see him at the end of the season. So it's a really big deal for them. And I, you're right. Like he will bring in the Argentina and, money. And, and that is one of the, the lesser, you know, discussed factors and obviously talent and, and scale and the ability to score points is, is hugely massively important. But then if you look at, you know, the, the economics of, you know, the sponsors that are brought in, um, which we talked about sponsorships in at uh, the end of, uh, not the, our Monza. We talk about reaction. it a lot when it comes to Joe Guan Yu. We also talk about it all the time when it comes to, to Joe Guan Yu, but I was, you know, reading something. Teo Porcher has been kind of one of those like waiting in the wings type of rookies who, you know, one of the reasons why he doesn't have a seat is because he's not also bringing in a lot of money. Like, and money in Formula One is so prevalent and so important that 
teams are also looking at, you know, what drivers are bringing in, you know, can bring in sponsorship money to also help support them. So I think that that's, you know, having, you know, Mercado Libre show up 45 seconds after, you know, Colapinto was announced and who even knows, you know, from a behind the scenes standpoint, how much of like the timing of that, you know, was intentional, but that's a really important factor to think of. And so, you know, it really does make a very valuable case for Colapinto to go to, to stake next year. And then, you know, hopefully they will also, you know, get him to Audi. Cause he a could thousand be a, percent. A, a and like, there's a ton of Audi too. brands in like South America, even that would back him over any other driver because he's from Argentina. And it's, it's sad that like, you might be the very best driver, but you bring in zero money. And, like, how marketable are you, right? So, like, the money side of this sport, I think, is so fascinating. And there's so many different layers to it compared to, like, the NFL, right? Because, like, if you're number one, you're going to go number one. Doesn't matter. People will sign you. But you don't have to bring in money in the NFL. You just have to be good and win games. And that brings in money. But F1, it's so flip-flopped to where you have to bring in money and prove you can bring in money before you can get the seat. Yeah, and and that's why, you know, it what you know, Formula 1 is one of the most difficult sports in the world to be successful in. You know, yeah. at the highest level of motorsport is because of, you know, as you've been saying, money and sponsorships and being, you know, one of the 20 most skilled drivers on the planet. Yeah, it's wild, but Yeah. So anyways, we'll see. Getting back to the main blurb of this 10-minute spiel, (laughs) Franco potentially is being looked at by Audi, which is super exciting. And I think, you know, having James back you and, like, really push to help you get a seat, I think that's great for him, too. So to have that support. Yeah. Um, so this next one, I know Catherine is super, super excited. I am too, yep. but not as much as Catherine. Um, it came out that F1 is doing a collab with Lego, which is really cool. So it's going to be released in 2025 and it's likely going to feature all 10 teams, which is really cool. I don't know what all is coming out, but they're going to do a collaboration with F1, which is really cool. Yeah, and we've seen, you know, collaborations in the past between Lego and Formula One drivers and Formula One teams. Lando Norris just drove a Lego car the other it's day. Insane. Like they they've have like McLaren has a Lego one of the the old McLarens in in Lego form in their in their um facilities. I I love it. I have a McLaren Formula E car that um guest host Adam got me when I was recovering from surgery back in the spring that lives on my coffee table and was really fun to build, but like I need a Red Bull car. Um, So hopefully, because they have the McLaren Formula One cars, they have Mercedes Formula One cars, they have like a really big thousand piece Mercedes Formula One car, which is like, maybe after I get a Red Bull, I'll do. But um, I I really, you know, I would love to see, you know, having the opportunity to have as many cars in Lego form as possible. Yeah, I think they have like an old Ferrari too, like an old model Ferrari. I think they have. Yeah, they ha- they have some old ones. They have, I think, they have an old Senna, ca- mm-hmm. um, w- one of right. one of Senna's old cars. I I was at Target. They have a couple some of like the big I- iconic ones. Yeah, so it would be really cool to have to see what they're gonna come out of like modern Formula One. And you were saying like maybe we'll even get like a Toto Wolf minifig, which would be fun. And, I like, want to build how many- a whole paddock. Like that's what I want. I, I want would the whole paddock, love like with the um. All the garages, the pit pit walls. And the garage, and, like, everyone in their headsets. Like, that's what I want. And, like, the whole pit crew. I want to see that. Yeah. Really bad. So, 2025, we'll be counting down. Maybe Lego will send some fun stuff our way. That'd be nice. Please, give us things, Lego. Four for four. Four for five. Um, So, speaking of pit wall, we have a promotion on the pit wall for Red Bull. So, GP is taking over as the head of racing at Red Bull. So he currently is Max's race engineer and he will remain as Max's uh, race engineer, but he'll also take over the responsibility like for the race, which is really exciting. So he's going to head up their strategy group. Yeah. This is, this is in, in, this is all part of the, you know, Red Bull's doing a lot of reshuffling since Wheatley is leaving to go to, he's going to be the team principal at Audi steak. Yeah, he's gonna. I think he's gonna be their new team. 
Wheatley's left. He's going to be a team principal somewhere. It'll be relevant when he shows up. But this, I think this is great. I mean, other teams have been trying to to poach GP because he is a very talented race engineer. And it's not just because he's been a race engineer for Max as Max has been good. He's been Max's race engineer since Max has been at Red Bull. So it, you know, this is Red Bull really wants him to stay. And, you know, they're trying to keep as many people as possible, especially in Max's camp, which will also help make Max want to stay. Exactly. Yeah. For I however think long Max decides to. I think they've realized, like, they just, it's not like a keep Max happy game, but, like, it kind of is. And so him and GP have obviously done really, really well together. And so kind of having him lead the whole strategy and the whole team, I think will just, you know, help keep Max as, as long as he wants to stay. So. Yeah, which at the, oh, he, yeah, uh, first of all, Wheatley is going to Audi, but yeah, and, and, <laughs> Never doubt yourself, Catherine. <laughs> I mean, I, I, no there, there were only so I many. Make, you don't doubt yourself. <laughs> I was making the faces at myself too. But yeah, so, so Wheatley's going to Audi. They need a new, you know, head of, of, of racing. GP's great to do it. And Max will stay for as long as he wants to stay. And then he's like, I, we've said this before, and then he's probably going to retire when he decides that he's done and wants to be a, a solo sim racer. And he wants to do Le Mans, doesn't he? Oh, and he wants to do Le Mans. With you, I, w- I want to see Fernando Alonso and Max Verstappen drive Le Mans together. That's what that I would see. That would be amazing. I yeah. know. I know. Yeah, that would be fun. Uh, okay, so getting into something that I love to talk about, and that at the end of the season, we will have our top favorites. Let's talk helmets and liveries for Singapore. So, first, yes. I want to jump into helmets. So, Alex Albon and Joe Gonyu, those are the only two that I've seen so far, but love them so alex albon has a thailand inspired helmet so he is he does drive under the thai flag that's like his heritage um and where he's from and so he's doing a thailand inspired helmet being in that region of the world and it's a collab with monsoon valley vineyard and it's really cool it was designed by a thai artist i'm gonna butcher this pronunciation try gong khan I think so. I think think that's how you pronounce it. Apologies if that's completely wrong. Um, I can't pronounce anything. So, but it's really cool. I really like it. I think it's super different and super fun. And I really like Alex Albon's like one-off helmets as well when he does the specialty ones. I think he does. I mean, he had the panda. So let's be real. We don't even have to contest that one. Panda's number one. But um, yeah, I don't know though because Zhou Guan Yu's helmet this weekend holds a special place in my heart. Yeah. So it's a neon yellow sweet corn helmet. If you don't know who sweet corn is, it's not a thing. It's a who. It's his cat. So Zhou Guan Yu has the cutest, cutest cat, sweet corn. And he has a helmet just pretty much honoring his cat. And then there's the Marina Bay Sands um, hotel on the back. So it's pretty cool. Um, highly suggest you guys check them out. But I just, I love that Zhou is such a cat dad and like has a helmet just for the cat. I wish it would have been a little like bit most, more. But there's I'm a okay. lot of Formula One drivers who are like cat parents. Max Verstappen has cats. Alex <laughs> Albon has like 800 a- <laughs> animals and also like four cats. Jo- and I, I just, I love Zhou Guan Yu's cat because like sweet corn, like that's that's like the English translation of the cat's name because it doesn't actually translate into English. So he's like, that's the closest yeah. uh, we get. But I, I love it. Could have could have a little bit more, but he had to leave the top. But the helmet is the same holographic design that he has on on all of his regular helmets. So I guess you can just slap a giant cartoon of sweet corn right on top. And then what I love about Alex's is it says grape juice on the bottom, which I feel like has to do with the legalities of promoting alcohol where wherever I, I don't know if it's like a Singapore you know question of promoting alcoholic beverages or a Thai question of promoting alcoholic no, it's beverages F1. is it F1 yeah because if you look at it all of like the Estrella and everything like that's a beer but it only is promoting the zero percent when it's like Heineken it shows like Heineken zero so it's mm. an F1 thing like we've moved away yeah. from like our Marlboro <laughs> sponsorship days and yeah. now we're promoting zero alcohol beers so yeah it's, i'm pretty sure it's a formula one thing uh yeah you're probably right which i so i just think it's just grape juice on the on the bottom if, if you look closely at the home at the home you'll see on the the monsoon valley it just says grape juice under it and i just think that's just so funny because wow. i mean it is a form of grape juice it's fermented 
Yes, exactly. Grapes are grapes. Grapes. <laughs> Grapes. Uh, well, those are the only two that we've seen so far, but I'm sure as soon as this comes out on Thursday, we'll have several other specialty helmets. Um, as we do. As we always do, but if we find some really cool ones, we can always do it in our recap. Super off track, but I was just thinking, I would pay good money to see Lewis Hamilton with a Roscoe helmet. Just like full, like Panda, but Roscoe. Oh, I... I like a tongue. That. Like I want a tongue like flapping in the wind on the side. <laughs> like obviously painted on, but like uh, with like his little his little squishy face and just like a big tongue. Oh my gosh. I will design it for him. They've I love approved that. worse things, so I'm sure it'll be oh, fine. Fully. Um, Speaking yeah, of no. approving bad things. Yes. Liveries. Yes. So <laughs> or just not having them at all. So Red Bull was yeah. supposed to have a special livery in uh, Singapore and Kota, but they're not because they looked into it and it's going to add too much weight to the car. So they're like, we'd love to do it. It's so cool. But um, yeah, no, we're, we're not participating. So. Well, yeah, but not, it's like, they have so many other issues with the car. They don't want to also add weight to it. So I understand that, but also we've discussed the the issue of like paint on the car and, you know, how you just suck it up and just give us a good livery. But then my other side of this is, is it really that much of a bummer? Obviously for the people who designed the special livery, it's a huge bummer, but in general, is it that much of a bummer? Because the liveries that Red Bull has given us this year as their special liveries have not been great. No, but, like, this gave them two more opportunities to, like, turn it around, you know? I don't know. This whole weight thing with the car, I think they have so many issues with the car. If you add a little bit of weight, what's it really going to do? You know what I mean? Like, clearly it's going to do enough that's going to make Max more upset. Allegedly, it's going to be the end of the world, which is why they canceled it. But I think it's a cop-out. I think they're being lazy. I think they should have done more things to the car so that they could have done the special livery. And that's the end of that. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm gonna sit here in the camp of like, remember the splatter paint livery that was incredibly not impressive, and just be like, uh, I'll just keep the regular Red Bull livery and just move on to Mercedes and their new livery this weekend. Yeah, so they're celebrating Patronus's fiftieth anniversary with an all green Patronus livery, which will be really cool. I love when we do tribute liber- liveries. I love when we really change it up so they're going from like mostly black to all green which is really cool so i'm excited to see how it looks yeah it's not super exciting but it's different no it's i mean people have been saying like oh you know mercy or aston martin called they want their livery back but it's a different shade of green Um, but i was looking at what the the actual (laughs) i was looking at what the actual livery like you know, difference is because I was like, wait, what does the actual Mercedes car even look like? And the there's like a on the on the front wings, there's like a like a little swoop of green on the edges. Mm -hmm. And basically, that's just the color of both of the body of the car. And I'm here for it. It, You know, Petronas is one of their like primary, like, without Petronas, Mercedes wouldn't be on the Formula One grid. If you go back to everything that was happening at Braun and the transition from Braun to Mercedes and how that was was going, which I, we didn't really talk a lot about that in our reaction to the to the Braun documentary, but it is touched on in the documentary itself. But you know, if Petronas didn't come in and be like, "We want to be one of the title sponsors of Mercedes," then Mercedes might not have come back into Formula One and taken over Braun, and Braun might have just like died out as a team eventually. Yeah, yeah, because isn't it? I'm gonna pull a Total Wolf here. Isn't it like? Mercedes AMG Patronus F1 team like it's in their name yeah yeah they're they're one of the the title sponsors yeah because like um Martin Brundle will always call them Mercedes Benz but Benz does not have a part (laughs) of the actual Formula One team with Mercedes that's fine it works yeah okay and then we come to my favorite team with liveries this season. So I loved their Miami special livery. Yes. I love their normal livery. So we're talking about B carb. And we're, you know, I'm a little lost on like the path that they're taking, but I'm here for it. So they went with jean. And if you're questioning that, yes, I do mean like denim jeans. 
So they have like a whole jean denim thing going on. It yeah. sounds weird. It's like not horrible and it's different. You know what? I applaud them for being different. I applaud them for pushing the envelope, doing something out of the box, and having fun with it. I feel like this is like the fun team at Red Bull and like Red Bull is like like varsity Red Bull is like super serious and this is like, hey, we're just JV, like we're gonna do what we want. Yeah. Um, I'm here for them trying. Honestly though, I hope that they do special race suits and I hope they're full denim not like actual but like the pattern or do like a cool overall or something my guess is that this is in line with like Hugo Boss which is one of their sponsors which is clothing so that's like the only thing I can draw from this because that's I mean I don't know where else they would have gotten the whole denim idea but the the thing about it for me is like, yeah, the more you look at it, the less ridiculous it seems. And it like actually right. looks like if you look at the the pattern, like the, the actual denim pattern on like the top of the car, it actually looks really good up close and in pictures. I don't know how well this is going to translate on TV. Obviously, you know, V-Carp doesn't yeah. get a lot of TV time during races, especially these days with everything happening up at the front. But you know, I think like it's it's a really cool gimmick if you're there and if you're looking at it up close and maybe we'll get some lucky shots on TV for those of us who are waking up at four o'clock in the morning to watch this five o'clock start race. Ayo. But I I don't hate it. Like it's it's not their it's not my favorite livery from them this season. That's definitely Miami, but I'm into it. Right. And I, again, I think it's fun, it's different, good for them. But yeah, I completely agree. Like it's cool in pictures, but it's it doesn't look that different from their like OG normal livery. So maybe TV like it'll be fine because it won't. It's not that big of a difference. But I, I don't know. It's hard when you design for like in person pictures and then three hundred kilometers per hour. Like that's right. That's that's, that's always gonna 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 be the challenge. But like the the big old zipper on the side as a car it's on cool. the on the side bots is cool. Yeah. So yeah. like it's it's cool. It's unique. It's it's very funky. And the longer you look at it, the more you're gonna probably be like, okay, I can I can see what they're doing. I see the vision. Yeah. Sure. Something like that. Again, I just want to see their racing suits. I hope they go with the full denim look. Like I want Canadian tuxedo to yeah. the nines. I mean, Danny would do that anyway, even though it's going to be like a hundred million degrees in, with like a thousand percent humidity because it's Singapore. Um, but I can see, I could see like Danny walking into the paddock in a Canadian tuxedo. Like he would do that. I'm pretty sure he did Dakota one year. Probably. God, never Probably. forget him entering on a horse. Such oh, the such horse. a great thing. Obsessed. Yeah. yeah. Oh. oh, Danny, such a character. Such a character. Okay, I think that's all I had for news of the week. So we can jump into Singapore. And yes, before we start talking about this season, I think this was my favorite se- my favorite race last season because of the Carlando team up to push yes. back the Mercedes and also Max didn't win. So this was like the only race last year that wasn't won by Red Bull. Carlos won this last year. It was super exciting. And him and Lando kind of like worked together to keep push or to keep back the Mercedes. And also George crashed. And also George crashed. <laughs> yeah. Lap. Um so kind of like last week, but you know, a little different. He he just crashed by himself, drove right into the wall. Um never forget. Yeah never forget yeah Yeah, that was one of the moments in drive to survive where we were like how can you talk about carlos's win in singapore which they had to talk about because it was the only non-red bull win but how can you talk about that without talking about the like the factor that lando played in that because if lando didn't work with carlos then you know it would have been a lot more difficult for carlos to win that race it was a lot more difficult for lando to maintain p2 because they had to hold off both of those mercedes behind them and so like the fact that netflix did not include the carlando team up in drive to survive still baffles me to this day Catherine, we needed to fit our five episodes about Alpine in. We didn't have I time know, for it's that. all about Al it was all about <laughs> Alpine and the fact that Viva La France was never going to work. How dare we not have sixteen hours of that coverage? Tell me how you really feel, Catherine. You know me and my opinions. 
Oh, I know. Well, we have a lot to look forward for this weekend in Singapore. So yes. one, someone's returning to the grid. Came back. Yeah. Came back. <laughs> so after sitting out a, you know, one race penalty, the slate is wiped clean. He no longer has a bajillion penalty points. And the wrecking ball that is K-Mags will be back in Singapore. So my question to you, and I think we've talked about this a little bit, but Singapore is not like the easiest track and it does get a little dicey with, you know, the overtaking and how it's a pretty narrow track. It's almost impossible to overtake. Do we think he's like, you know what? screw it I'm not coming back I have zero penalty points I'm just gonna drive lights out and if I hit somebody I hit somebody or is he gonna actually like drive responsibly I mean I think he will like he I I think more than anything he does want to put on a good performance for Haas it's just this year his role at Haas has been sacrificial lamb in favor of Nico Hulkenberg you know by and large so I I really think that like Yes, we all make the jokes of like, yeah, he has seven races to, you know, build back, you know, his his 12 uh, penalty points. I don't think we're going to see a wrecking ball Kevin Magnuson. I think if anything, we're going to see like Kevin Magnuson pulling a, you know, DRS chicken, DRS train type of deal like Fernando Alonso did in Monaco in 2022. Or- yeah. Yeah, in 2022, when he backed mm-hmm. out, you know, the entire, you know, like half half of the field up um, and other than like the top five drivers who are literally on the other side of the track. So I think we're going to see more of like that type of chaos than we would be likely to see like wrecking ball Kevin Magnuson. That's fair. That's fair. Speaking of DRS, there's DRS changes this year in Singapore. Yes. Yes, there are. Um, I think that this is this is very interesting because they kind of they campaigned for this last year. Right. But they apparently did not, you know, there was no consensus amongst the teams and drivers about whether they wanted this or not. But this year we will have a fourth DRS zone between turns 14 and 16 to, I think, boost overtaking opportunities. Like we've said, it's really hard to overtake here, but this might be a way to try to throw in a little bit more excitement. Yeah, I agree. I mean, they're only going to help increase and better the product, right? So adding another DRS zone does help with the overtaking. That's why there's a DRS zone to begin with. So yeah. I applaud the effort. I don't think it will be successful though, because of how hard it is to overtake there, regardless of DRS zones. Yeah, that's that's the real question. Like, will it help? Because this is, you know, 14 to 16 is a pretty long, I don't want to call it a straight, but it's a pretty long portion of the track. Where, right. Like, turn 15 is less of a turn. They call it, like, a kink. It's, it's you're, you're not going, like, an actual turn. It's just you're kind of, like, nudging a little in a different direction before going back. And... Well, the answer is, is, is we don't know. I was talking to my dad before we were recording, and it's, you know, will this you know, change last. And the question is, it depends on how exciting this race is going to be um, and how much of a factor the DRS zone addition is going to be on it. Yeah. I mean, I I personally feel like three-fourths of the track is now a DRS zone. <laughs> That's um, the other problem. But so it's like, what's the point? Like, why would you add one? Would you maybe like just take them all away? But I don't know. We'll see. We literally have no idea. So. Yeah, this is one of the longer tracks on the calendar. So the, you know, you can, you know, afford to, you you can't put four DRS zones in Monaco. You can put four DRS zones. (laughs) You could also make Monaco a sprint race. But here we are. Also, also that. Uh, And for for our thoughts on that, we have linked up there. But yeah, I I think that there's really not going to be an answer. And I think the FIA is just saying, yeah, we'll see. I mean, give it a shot. If it sucks, we'll take it out next year. It's like, it's not, I don't think it's that big of a deal to really make that big of a difference, positively or negatively, in the race. Yeah. I mean, maybe this is going to be the thing that makes Singapore even more exciting than it always is. Right. So, who knows? Good point. So, something that always makes things exciting at every race, but I think particularly Singapore, is weather. So. How's our, our weather, weather girl? How, how are we looking in Singapore? I don't think it's super great. Um, so it's, first of all, the humidity is all, is going to be 
up in the sky, but that's Singapore for you. That's just where, where it is. But there are going to be scattered thunderstorms predicted for Friday and Saturday mornings, which because this is a night race, it's not really going to have much of an impact on the race itself, except one factor is that when you have rain, that washes any rubber that gets laid down following a session or during a session. So if there's gonna be anything that does impact that, it's going to be the early portions of practice sessions, the early um, early portions of qualifying that could make things tricky as they're gonna be putting down some rubber. Now we will have some support races and we'll talk about F1 Academy in a minute, but we will have the other, you know, the other support races. So it's not like they're gonna be coming onto a completely green track, but it's still, you know, they're not going to have a lot of that stuff built on it from the night before if there's going to be rain that washes things off in the morning. Plus, this is a street track, so everything kind of, you know, the, the configuration, the tra- like the asphalt stuff is going to be completely different than something purpose-built like Zanvor. Yeah. Oh, way to throw Zanvort in there. I love that. It was the first one that came to mind. It's a great one. No, I think it'll yeah. be interesting. And it always is interesting to see how, like, weather and rain times do throw things for a loop or, or don't. Or maybe it's a non-factor. But so many dependent or variables here. But yeah, Exactly. Cool. Okay. Well, I think we can get into our predictions for Singapore. Yes. Maybe? Let's go. I had to do, like, a panic because I was like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Uh, but it's not a sprint race that's the next or when we're in coda it's a sprint race that's coda yeah i just i feel like we haven't had a sprint in so long and they're all just gonna like creep up on us at the end so yes yes i think anyways i I know you are right (laughs) i don't think i know well with that so Catherine and i pick pole podium and p10 we're actually keeping track this year because last year we took some liberties. This year we're taking it super serious and still not getting anything. So doesn't really make a difference, but we try anyways. Catherine, who is your pole sitter for Singapore 2024? That's a great question. Let me bring up my notes app. Um, I picked Charles Leclerc. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I, yeah. Yeah. I, I struggled with this one because I was like, oh, it's this Charles is a good one, but I was like, you know what? He can't have like that many good races back to back. So I went with Oscar. Okay. Yeah. I mean, my, I, you know, I, I feel like I had been flip-flopping between like Oscar and Lando back and forth for like weeks now. And, you know, Charles may have, you know, a lot of great, or he may be doing better race wise, but he still is a really solid qualifier that just does not know how to convert pull to an actual victory and every time it does happen it feels like it's a fluke uh so yeah i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna go with charles and we'll see how wrong i am in a couple of days we'll see or you could be right yeah you never know or i could be right. right so for your podium who is sitting on your podium well like i said charles does not know how to convert pole to a win very well. So I am going with an Oscar Piastri win, a Charles Leclerc P2, and a Lando Norris P3. Okay. I almost have the same thing. So I have an okay. Oscar. I have an Oscar P1. I have a Charles P2. And I have Carlos as P3. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Let's see what Carlos can do. I mean, he was, I know. you know... He, I, I think, I think he's due for you know getting getting back up there, and obviously he knows how how to podium in Singapore. Yeah, uh, he always. Yeah. I feel like he does pretty well in Singapore, and I feel like he does well at night too. So yeah, I don't know. Maybe that's quirky, just me, quirky, quirky things. Oh, okay, well that brings us to P ten. We pick P ten, which is actually the hardest thing to pick in the entire world. You get one point for P10 on the grid, but we give ourselves three because it is so difficult. So for P10, who you got? So coming off my successful prediction last week. Rub it in, Catherine. Um, well, I'm just I'm saying this because I know I'm going to regret making this prediction because every time I do pick this one for P10, I do regret it, but I am going with Danny. And okay. You know, I'm definitely going to regret this come the end of the weekend, but something was telling me to pick Danny for for P10 this time. So 
you know, you we'll, we'll see how, how great I'm feeling about this come Sunday. I have an oldie but a goodie. I, based on how hard it is to overtake in Singapore and how qualifying has been going, I am going Nico Hulkenberg. Okay. He always is generally, like, right there, and I feel like it's a it's a good one for him this weekend, so. Well, a Haas car did finish P10 last year in, in Magnuson, mm-hmm. so you could, you could be, you could be close. We'll see. We'll see. Well, those are the three that we pick for points, and then we also do biggest surprise and who's going to do a dumb. So my biggest surprise, I'm just going to jump right to it because I'm really excited about it. Okay. My biggest surprise is that Williams is going to have back-to-back double points weekends. Woo! I what? like that. I know. I am, like, fully on this Williams train. I am number one in line to be all of their number one fans. If they don't have a fan, it's because I'm dead, and I am now T. Williams. So, yeah. There totally here for it. <laughs> so my big surprise, and and I, I picked this in the fact that like this would be really surprising if this happens. My biggest surprise, which is totally going against my podium pick, is Max Podiums in Singapore. You know what? I think that's a really good one. Because this is would... this is historically his worst race. Yeah, he I I actually I looked it up. He has only podium twice in the seven times he has raced in Singapore. Only two podiums. He one year was a P two and one was a P three, and those were like pre COVID. And he's never won. And he has never won in Singapore. This is like his white whale. Yeah. So my big surprise, and you know, also based on his performance lately, it would be a huge surprise if he podiums in here. Yeah. No, I like that one. Thank you. It's a really good one. Yep. Um. Okay. And for who's gonna do a dumb? Like it really pains me to do this to my my you know my buddy Lando but I just think the pressure is just gonna get to him on trying to like race Max to driver's championship and I just think it's starting to combust and I think something bad's gonna happen to him in in Singapore so I just think he's gonna have a really really weak showing this weekend I also picked Lando as my job. Um, and I wasn't even thinking about like the Lando versus Max side side of the, the challenge, but I was more thinking of like the reason Oscar is going to be able to overtake Charles again and win this race in Singapore as, you know, per my podium is because Lando does something that keeps him far enough behind Oscar that they can't implement papaya rules. Yeah. I just think, like, I feel bad because, I mean, he was doing so well, and now I think there's so much pressure, like, from the media of, like, oh, well, is it, it's Oscar versus Lando, and Lando's chasing Max, and, like, yes, he's a very high-level athlete, and he's really good under pressure, but I just think, like, when you're at that point, you just put so much pressure on yourself internally, and it's just too much, and I just, I just think something bad gonna happen bad is gonna happen because like max can take it because like max literally doesn't care right like he does but he doesn't so i feel like that's why he's so different and then you have lewis who's just like a completely different he's built so much different than any other athlete and i think lando is just not ready for that pressure maybe he is maybe i'm wrong no i i agree with you and i think that like it also took Max quite a long time to get the better of Lewis and it wasn't easy and it wasn't right. pretty. And I mean, that's what, you know, drew me to Max in the first place when I started getting into formula one in 2021 was like, Oh, that guy's a jerk. I like it. Um, but it, you know, there were years where he would get close and, you know, this is Lando's first opportunity of like sniffing a driver's championship. And that's a lot of pressure, especially when it's going up against Max, when it's, you know, going from where McLaren was at the beginning of 2023, when he had five pit stops in Bahrain, cause they had to keep refilling the hydro fluid or whatever was coming out Never of his car. Forget. Never forget. But yeah, I, I think, I think that this is, this is getting to be a lot for him and, you know, I, I don't know how this is going to go for him this year, but I know that this might cause him to have some mental oopsie daisies. And I think that this weekend is going to be one of them. Yeah. I just think it's, it's a really hard track. And if you have like a little oops, it's a big oops. You yes. know what I mean? 
Yes. Also, that especially in qualifying and everything in Singapore is predicated on having a good qualifying performance. Yeah. So. All right. Well, before we wrap up, let's get our F1 Academy update. So we haven't had F1 Academy in a hot minute, but they are racing this weekend. Before you give us the update, I just want to say I love that they chose Singapore as an F1 Academy race. I don't, it probably won't be at night just because it is a support race, but I love that they're going to Singapore. It's such a cool track. It's a street track. So I love that they're giving, you know, these women different opportunities at completely different tracks. Oh, like, yeah. Like what a fully. good experience that is. So yeah, they, they are, they're really giving us such a great variety of Formula One tracks throughout this entire season, starting at, you know, Saudi Arabia as as one type of street track to, to Singapore. We had Zanvoort, we had Barcelona, they'll be in Abu Dhabi. I think they're also going to Qatar. I think those are the last two races, but we are coming back for round five of seven. So there's gonna be two more races after after this weekend. We will have a wild card driver this weekend. So Bill Lloyd will be driving the wild card. She's currently competing in British F4. This is her rookie year in single season which for a number of Fun Academy drivers already, they are also in their rookie year of single seaters. So she's really kind of on par with a lot of the grid. Going to be a little bit of a challenge because this is going to be her first time in an F1 Academy car this weekend. She will be driving under a special livery and race suit to spotlight F1 Academy's Discover Your Drive initiative, which is aimed at inspiring the next generation of female talent down at the karting level and bringing them from karting and bringing more equity in karting and then bringing that up to the you know lower tiers in motorsport. So I think that's really cool. I'm really excited to see what she can do. Um, I think that it's a little interesting that it's not someone you know that's of you know actually from Singapore nationality wise that they're bringing in as a wild card but you know it's still gonna be a great opportunity for her and so I'm really excited to see how she performs yeah I agree I mean it all goes back to like getting into karting and getting into racing is very very expensive and so very few people do it and Singapore is not a big country so what are the chances that someone from Singapore is at the level where it's like safe for them to jump into an F1 Academy car? So if it comes down to that with like safety and where they're actually at, like I completely agree grabbing another wild card. But like if there was someone at that caliber and they chose someone from, you know, um, England versus Singapore, then that's kind of weird. But yeah. they probably just didn't have anybody. Yeah, no, you're you're probably not wrong. It just it... But at the same time, I feel like they could have picked someone from like a neighboring country versus yeah, Singapore. that's that's my thought too. Is is somebody like from the region, and I don't really know what you know Lloyd's background actually is. You know, based based on that, you know, if she does Dual have citizenship, have ties to who knows? Yeah. yeah, I I don't know that. Didn't look that closely, but it's still a great opportunity. I love the wild cards. Obviously, we had Nina Gaidman in Zandvoort who tore it up and everybody's yeah. like give her a contract for for next year which i still think is something that Susie wolf should and probably will do because she's so good but yeah i'm i'm very curious to see uh from a driver standing standpoint it's very close at the top there's only 71 points between Paul pulling and dorian pon uh in p1 and p2 now pon can't overtake pulling completely by by getting a clean clean sleep and wins but if she does then we will have a title fight on our hands just as we expected we were going to have and then there are 30 points between pawn and haas's chloe chambers and i just love that like we have a haas driver <laughs> in p3 in a championship because that's like the best performing Haas in the history of Haas in you know, the upper tiers of motorsport. And then there are four points between Chambers and Nerea Marti, who's the Tommy Hilfiger driver, which is one of the other really fun liveries that we just are obsessed with. Wow. And then from a constructor standpoint, Roden Motorsport overtook Prama Racing for the lead in the constructor standings after Zanvoort, but that's only six points between them. So that could easily flip flop depending on who does well this weekend. And really the constructors battle is very tight in those top three positions. And then, you know, the last, you know, the bottom two teams, MP Motorsport and ART Grand Prix are kind of just duking it out and they flip flop between four and five, just depending on who does a little bit better. But there's a lot of space between P3 and P4 in this championship. And it's really about those top three teams and seeing who's going to come out on top towards the end of the season. Yeah, and there's so many points available every single F1 Academy weekend. So these can flip around so easily. 
Yeah, exactly. So it, it'll be interesting to see. I think this is going to be a really indicative weekend of what we're going to see down the stretch, just especially between pulling and pawn. And I'm very excited to see how this goes toward the end of like the championship battle toward the end of this year. Oh, me too. For sure. Yeah. Well, thanks for the F1 Academy update. I'm Anytime. so excited. There's so, I love F1 Academy weekends because I feel like there's just so much racing that I actually like get to watch on weekends. So. Yeah. Also to point out, because I don't think we've talked about it lately, but all of the F1 Academy races are available to stream for free on YouTube. So even if you don't wake up in the middle of the night to watch the race, because they tend to be especially for uh, us or, Americans yeah. at like really bad times. But, you know, I will just throw it on whenever I, I wake up or after qualifying and just watch what had happened. But they have all of it available for free on YouTube, which is really great for access, which we've talked out the nose about how important it is to make this as accessible as possible so it's very accessible you can watch it on youtube you can watch it on f1 tv uh, obviously youtube is free if you don't have f1 tv so. there you go well i know that was a fun fact but let's get into your official f1 fun fact for this weekend Yes, so our official F1 fun fact is about the Singapore Grand Prix. There has been a safety car deployed in each Singapore Grand Prix race. In the 22 Singapore Grands Prix, they have had 24 deployments as of last year's race. So there is a very high likelihood, probability, that we will see a safety car in this race. Obviously, we had a safety car or a virtual safety car to end uh, last week's race. But, you know... Safety cars tend to mix things up a bit and, you know, change up strategy. So it would be nice to, you know, maybe have that safety car not be at the total end of the race and maybe, you know, somewhere you know, it, it can actually happen. make an impact on. Hmm. This is what's going to happen. Ferrari is going to go with their strong strategy of there will be a safety car. And just and it's wait. it's just going to mess up the whole thing and there's not going to be a safety car. I'm putting my money well, on I mean. That. My 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 question is, is the safety car going to do what it did last week or is it going to do what it did in Monaco where it was like the first lap was a safety car and then we didn't have one again? So like I, I, I'm requesting if we're going to have to have a safety car, can we have a safety car like at a time where it's going to change up the strategy for all of the teams and make things a little bit more intriguing? If you're going to crash, I can recommend. you crash it like and lap prefer 30? You to do it at a- at a time that is more convenient for me. Yes, so. exactly. It's all about me. Let's be real. We notice. Well, there we go. But all, always, here's hoping there are no safety cars because we don't like when people crash. Also that. Also, also that. Also that. But, all right. Well, that is all we have for the Singapore Grand Prix 2024. I'm super excited for this weekend. I think this is... This is definitely in my top three of races, and Catherine and I all and I have always said this is like one of the best on the calendar. So entertaining, even though there's not a lot of overtaking, like it's really fun to watch. So tune yeah. in. Make sure you keep up with us and follow us on socials this weekend. Catherine's really good at it. I try and get the the morning the morning ones in, but Catherine you get the really really, really early stuff. <laughs> I get the early stuff. So if you guys follow us on Instagram and you see stuff come out early in the morning, it's me. Otherwise, it's, it's definitely not me. <laughs> uh, but that is it. We will also have our Singapore Grand Prix um, recap episode out on Monday. But that's all I got. Anything else? Any last words? That's all I got. Perfect. Thanks for going off track with us, guys. <laughs>